he decides he needs a rebound relationship, but he can't seem to get one. Every date that his friend set him up on, it's not, it's not happening. It's not panning out. Hold on, don't go. I've scared you. I've said too much. I'm hopeless and awkward and desperate for love. <laughs> and it's just like, how in the world, like what a bad personality you must have if you as a Prince of England can't get a date on your own. Like, can you imagine how, how like just absolutely dull and awful he must have been in conversation for like him to be struggling to get a date and he's like just begging all his friends to hook him up with somebody? Out of the question. Why? No, I'm not gonna do that. That's one step away from personal ads and prostitutes. No, no, I am not going down that road. What does she look like? I was floored. Okay, so he can't get a date. Um, then he meets this girl named Florence, but they call her Flea. These names. Hmm. And um, he and Flea are like super into each other. She just broke up with this guy, but she's ready to mingle and he's ready to take her there. So they have a great time and it's all like the paps have not figured it out. And so he's just in, you know, seventh heaven, but that's short lived. And she calls him up crying, weeping. She can't take it anymore. She can't take it and she won't take it. I can't stand it anymore. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Because she says that the, the paparazzi have, have taken pictures of her and now across all the newspapers and splashed that she's an underwear model. And, and she did model one time that one time, but now that's all that she's ever going to be known for. It's just so minimizing, so reductive, so degrading. And he's like, please, please don't go. And she's like, I am. And then she probably hooks up with her old boyfriend again. So he feels just an absolute stab in the heart. How could this happen? What, I mean, how in the world is this his life? He can't get over it. Your bros are always there for you. They have got your back after your hoe rips your heart out for no good reason. And you were nothing but great to your hoe. And you told her that she was the only hoe for you and that she was better than all the other hoes in the world. And then, then suddenly she's not your hoe no mo. And he can't sleep and he's just profoundly dejected and he's just so disappointed, but he's got to pull it together because he is in the army after all. And he is just about to have to go into a series of maneuvers and exercises to test how much he knows and how he would function under extreme pressure. And he goes on to tell us one of the wildest stories I have ever heard in my life. And you guys, listen, I don't know everything, obviously, but I know a few things about the way the military works. Having had a husband who was in the infantry, both as enlisted and as an officer. And I can tell you that this story is bananas. I just can't even begin to believe this on any practical level. Maybe they would do this in special forces. I can totally imagine this happening in special forces, but for Harry's level and his rank and what was expected of him and also just who he was as a person in the world, as a prince, I just, I failed to buy any of this, but he says, he claims, that here they were off to go on a series of maneuvers and they were gonna to go to this desolate place called Bodeman Moor. Um, it was freezing cold. And he had just come back from an exercise in the States in which he had been in the, I think he was in Arizona or somewhere. So he had been quite warm there and now he's in the freezing, freezing cold. And um, you know, he was with 20 other soldiers and he says that they were gonna spend the first few days trying to acclimate. So they rose at 5 a.m., went for a run, uh, you know, ran till they threw up, then they bundled into classrooms and they learned the latest methods that bad actors had devised for snatching people. So this whole maneuver, this whole exercise, this whole play act is to see uh, what will you do when you are behind enemy lines and how will you react under pressure and when there are people trying to come and get you, what are you going to do? Okay. So their mission is to evade the enemy and escape the forbidding terrain. Now, his saving grace is that he happens to be with a guy named Phil, who apparently, as, as at some walkabout, had walked this moor and so claimed to have known something about it. Okay, 
well, he doesn't have, he doesn't end up being the help that we all had hoped Phil would be. Not that Phil turns actively against him, but I mean, there's nothing Phil could have done in this scenario. Um, it's freezing cold. Harry writes extensively about the need to spoon with his male compatriots. Um, then he says that the exercise required them to stop at several checkpoints. And at each checkpoint, there was an exercise that they had to, um, or a task that they had to complete before they could move on. Okay, so they manage, manage, manage. They hit the checkpoints, they performed, they were doing good, blah, 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 we're done, we're good. They finally get to the safe house, hooray, it's all great. In the pitch black of night, they are rescued from the safe house and that they are supposed to, you know, go home, they're done. But, not so. This is when the real test begins. What do we do? Use the surge of fear and adrenaline to sharpen your decision making. <laughs> The vehicle that they're in is stopped, and suddenly a group of men in camo jackets and black balaclavas show up, and he's freaking out, sort of. Um, they are then taken to, their, their bags are put over their heads, they're taken to another location, like an underground bunker type of thing, and then he says, he writes, that in some rooms they were treated well, in others they were treated like dirt. He said emotions went up and down. One minute we'd be offered a glass of water, the next we'd be shoved to our knees and told to keep our hands above our heads. 30 minutes, an hour from one stress position to another. He says they hadn't slept in 72 hours. Okay. And he says that much of it was illegal under the rules of the Geneva Convention, which was of course the goal. I've never understood the Geneva Convention. I mean, it's a nice idea, but really, is a terrorist ever going to follow it? He says it was just torture. They interrogated them. They uh, played atonal music that sounded like a violin being played by a young child. On and on and on. He was so delirious that he at one point thought it actually was a child, perhaps being tortured in the next room, and he was a little concerned for the child. But then he says, and this makes me just be like, okay, this didn't really happen. Because if this really happened, you would not be saying this next thing. He said that some men came and began to interrogate his friend, Phil. And they had gone through Phil's social media and they had seen quite a few things about Phil. Um, they had compiled quite a picture on him. And so they said, they say to Phil, look, we know about your family. We know about your girlfriend. Phil's starting to freak out. Harry turns to him and this is what Harry writes. He says, I smiled. Welcome to the party, pal. Okay. You're going to tell me you haven't slept for 72 hours, but you have it in your head to mock Phil or sort of to, to triumph in Phil's um, negative experience because now finally he gets to see what it's like. Really? I don't think that you would have done that. Okay, well, I mean, apparently he did smile and apparently he did say welcome to the party or he his, his, his demeanor was that he wasn't taking it very seriously because he said one of the men grabbed him and shoved him against the wall. He, he ordered him to stand three feet from the wall, arms above his head, his fingertips pressed against the wall. Another stress position that he's got to hold for time after time, minute after minute. After 10 minutes, his, sh his shoulders are starting to seize. And he can't breathe, he says. Okay, and then a woman enters, and she's wearing some getup on her head. And he, she keeps paddling on and on, but he can't sort of figure out what in the world she's talking about. Then she, he says that she starts mocking him, saying, Your mother was pregnant when she died, huh? With your sibling, a Muslim baby. He says, I fought to turn my head to look at her. I said nothing, but I screamed at her with my eyes. You doing this for my benefit now or yours? Is this exercise or are you getting a cheap thrill? Okay, just a second here. Okay, so they just came back mocking Phil and rubbing Phil's face and everything he wouldn't want anybody to know or just uh, frightening him with things that he doesn't want people to know about. And... Suddenly he, you know, he, he, he had a grin for that. But now that they're coming for him with bits of information that would be quite unsettling for him to hear, now he's like, you're just taunting me. You're just getting a cheap thrill out of this. Me specifically. It's because of who I am that you're saying these things. Probably because this whole universe is against me. No, uh, you are here at the exercise for everybody else. And, you know... They could just comb through Phil's social media to find things about him, but everybody knows everything about you, supposedly. So what are they going to do to shock you, scare you, frighten you, make you, like, seize up and, and anger that they know something? Well, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you always, always got to make everything so weirdly personal. 
everybody was being tortured. Everyone was being tormented with information about their families. It wasn't like they suddenly out of nowhere came after him. So after, okay, so the whole thing ends. Um, suddenly everything's fine. And, and the exercise is done. Lights snap on. It's done. Okay, you guys are, are, are through. And he says that there was a debrief. But listen to this absolute immaturity that he, like, he's super angry. He's super pouty at what has just happened, not to all of them, but to him specifically. He said there was a debrief during which one of the instructors offered a half-assed apology about the stuff to do with my mother. Hard for us to find something about you that you'd be shocked we know. I didn't answer. We, f we felt you needed to be tested. I didn't answer. Well, but that, that took it a bit far. <laughs> Fair enough. Later, I learned that two soldiers in that exercise had gone mad. Okay, I have so many problems with this. First of all, why did they offer you an apology, specifically? And why did you expect them to? Are you a soldier or aren't you? I mean, you know that they are going to try to test you and make you break. Of course they were going to say something that was just outside the bounds of normal, decent behavior. Was any of it part of normal, decent behavior? And did anybody else receive an apology or expect to receive one because they had been involved in some training that was highly uncomfortable? It's like, the fact that he even writes about it, and by the way, two people went mad from it and you didn't. So I'm imagining that they got it a pinch worse than you.